evening and welcome to First Congregational Church of Los Angeles. I am Laura Bell Fragan and with my friend and colleague Alexander Lloyd Blake, we offer you tonight words of gathering. We pray that you will open your minds and your hearts to everything this evening will bring to you. Listen now to these words. In a time when the forces of division abound, we have dared to come together on this night. We come together because our love for God inspires it. Our commitment to humanity insists upon it, and what we can learn from each other requires it. In spite of our differences, we share many principles which spring forth from the teachings of our faith traditions and are echoed in and through the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. These principles include a conviction of the fundamental unity of the human family and the equality and dignity of all human beings. A realization that might is not right, that human power is not self-sufficient or absolute. A belief that love, compassion, selflessness, and the force of inner truthfulness and spirit have ultimately greater power than hate and inordinate self-interest. A sense of obligation to stand on the side of the poor, the hungry, and the oppressed, and to serve the cause of justice. A profound hope that good finally will prevail. Tonight, we affirm our commitment to stand together as a unified force and as a symbol of what life can be when we live together in the diversity the Creator dreams for all creation. May all these truths find their way into our hearts and our minds as together we give thanks for this one who has gone before us. Good evening, thank you again for being here. We'd like to start this uh, celebration by asking you all to stand with us and sing. Lift every voice and sing. Thank you.
God of love, we gather this evening to honor the life and the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We give thanks for Dr. King's prophetic witness, 
leadership, and sacrifice in the fight for the civil rights of African Americans. We ask that you give us the courage and determination to follow Dr. King's example in living the gospel of love and battling injustice. May you help us to live our convictions, even in the face of overwhelming opposition, so that we too may live a life dedicated to justice, peace, and equality. We pray today for all who hunger for thirst and righteousness, for those suffering the destruction of war, the fear of poverty, and the threat of racial and religious hatred and violence. We pray that all people may, may be free to live and to love. We ask your blessings upon children, that they may know your steadfast love, and that they live to see a just society where freedom reigns. O oh God, may we be reminded that we have all been created in your image. Help us to unite in a sisterhood and a brotherhood that transcends race, color, religion, and sexual orientation. Where our human community is divided by racism, torn by repression, saddened by fear and ignorance, fill us with your spirit so that we may give ourselves to your work of healing. And when we leave this place tonight, help us to remember the words of Dr. King. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Show us your light so that we may be living, shining examples of your love and peace in the world. May we live our lives as lives of truth, of action, of spirit, of faith. Make it so, Lord. Let it begin in me, in us, today. Blessed be. Amen.
Please all stand with us again as we sing Wade in the Water.
LGBTQ people have been present in social justice movements throughout history, though their contributions have not always been acknowledged. Bayard Rustin, for example, an organizer for labor and civil rights, who was central in the development of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, has only recently begun to receive the attention he deserves. The song we're about to sing, He Would Not Stay, and Who Can Wonder, is a setting of a four-line poem by the celebrated writer A.E. Hausman. There's a body of Hausman's work, however, published after his death that has received less attention, poetry which expresses his unrealized and unrequited love for another man. We perform He Would Not Stay to bring attention to the ways in which LGBTQ presence is often obscured in life, love, social movements, and to encourage you to think about the ways in which LGBTQ people have participated and continue to participate in movements for social justice.
Tonight, I forfeit the trolley for a walk in the midnight air. As my head full of the news, leaving, the pre leaving, leaving me perplexed as to what to do, slightly blue. Walking, not wanting to feel a care in the world. But one body after another, my head began to swirl. Concrete slabs, nooks and crannies, bearing your fanny in the frigid egg cold with the street as your commode. Humility and despair, the price one pays. High rises, high rents. Park benches few, as seldom as finding one new. A wheelchair be your bed, your tattered coat be your spread. You use to cover up to your head. Mumbles of senseless chatter, your voice, your best friend, as well as the demons within. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, Frankenstein, in your head, they all reside. Helter skelter from all that's been dealt her in this summer with no shelter, barely clothed because it swelters. Labile, senile, you walk the streets fragile because you, your mind is in denial. A cockroach and a rat, your bedfellows. The man that passed never saw you nor said hello. A cigarette, a, ca a crack pipe, a bottle of gin all keeps you warm and silences the chatter within. Your, ra your reality insane, you numb yourself to ease the pain. A family long forgotten. Your daily snort and port become your kin and your best friend. Your best friend, your worst enemy, your ambivalent dichotomy. Johnny Walker and Uncle Bean, you've listed to, for the corner to contact as your next of kin. Jack Daniels knew all your sins, read your eulogy straight off the label. He knew, he knew just how to enable. No glitz, no glamour, you weren't born a Kardashian. The Bible, revival, or more like reprisal, filled with the scriptures, all while living in denial. High rises, high rents, when privilege intersects with poverty, colliding at greed because Creed means everything. It's now extremely late. I approach my gate. A man shouts out, I want to die. I don't know why. Paralyzed, I think, oh my, oh my. I see bar flies through my per peripheral eye, sign, crying, denying, and lying, the parallels of lives colliding. High rises, high rents, when privilege intersects with poverty, while we continue to ask ourselves why. Hi, my name is Suzette Shaw. I'm a Skid Row resident. I write, talk, and advocate Skid Row from a woman's perspective. I was displaced to Skid Row approximately six years ago. I used to live a middle-class life in a middle-class neighborhood. I considered myself privileged with my own office and my name plaque on my door. I now consider myself free. I call my office the streets. I'm not a liberated woman, as I am just a woman who yearns to live free. I wish to live free from the bondage of inequality, so longing for equality that is yet, yet to be. Yeah, we've come far, but how far we have yet, yet to come. Women, women are still striving for their equal sum. Whether we're sitting in the White House, Donald Trump Plaza, or up in Beverly Hills, to the lows of the Appalachians, the rundown sawmills, or the Catskills. Whether your zip code is in Manhattan, New York, or right here in Skid Row. Human dignity should not come at the price for only those who can afford concierge prices and exquisite means. I humbly tell you my voice, it is my power. It fuels me each day. It gives me the strength which surpasses none. Instead, it allows me to be more of my equal sum. But please know, I'm just one voice. I have won no battles. The battles they have yet, yet to be won. This voice is just another gift God gave to me so I can stand tall for dignity and equality. There's a homeless count this week all throughout Los Angeles and surrounding cities. I have information to disseminate in regards to it. Here in LA County, Black folks are 9% of the population, yet 40% live in poverty to homelessness. 
I was part of LA County's Black People Experiencing Homelessness, Homelessness Ad Hoc Committee, which recently um, completed a report that will now be used as a model for people experiencing homelessness. As a matter of fact, it will be used as a national reference for people, black people experiencing homelessness. I have information that I can disseminate and have, as to where you can find that information as well. But I encourage you to get involved because if we don't care, take care of our, our most vulnerable, then we're not taking care of our entire community. I thank you for your time today, thank you.
Let's stand together and sing this little light of mine.
rest in Jesus. Just, just to take him.
have the senior minister of this great church, the ministerial staff, trustees, deacons, and members, I am delighted to introduce to you our speaker this evening, Reverend James M. Lawson, Jr. They met for a bite to eat at Oakland College 60 years ago. Two young black men in their 20s, both ministers, one Methodist, one Baptist. Dr. King was already a rising star in the Civil Rights Movement, and Reverend Lawson was a theology student. Since returning from his teaching post in India, he had thought about getting involved in the Civil Rights Movement, but had decided to wait until he completed his graduate studies. Come now, don't wait. Those words from Dr. King would begin a lifetime commitment to social justice and change. He didn't wait. He went south to Tennessee and got involved in the struggle, joining priests, rabbis, ministers, and others in the fight for justice. Dr. King called him the leading theorist and strategist of the nonviolent movement. That passion to be engaged, to get involved, to actively participate is what drives him today and has done so for most of his life. He spent time in prison, been jailed in numerous states, was arrested for praying on the grounds of the White House. Hmm. But he is not afraid of the, gospel, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And his love and passion for preaching the gospel has been the centerpiece of his life. By the time he was 19 years old, this third generation Methodist minister was licensed to preach. Early on, he saw the need to include economic equality and Dr. King endorsed Reverend Lawson's expansion of the civil rights agenda over 60 years ago. Issues related to race, jobs, the economy, immigration, pay inequality, gender discrimination, homelessness, and sexual harassment became part of his work. He carries a rich and diverse history of working across racial lines, speaking out against gay and lesbian discrimination, U.S. military involvement around the world, better pay for teachers, gun control, police violence, and the many other parts of the aggressive movement. He is Pastor Emeritus of Holman United Methodist Church here in Los Angeles, where he served as a senior pastor from 1974 to 1999. From that pulpit, he continued what Dr. King called a dangerous unselfishness, demanding social justice. Believing that being a pastor means to work to change the social environment. He calls his work at Holman one of his greatest joys and a tremendous privilege. At his 70th church anniversary, Holman awarded the inaugural William and Lawson Jr. Humanitarian Award to Marion Wright Edelman, founder of the Children's Defense Fund, in recognition for her commitment for the work on children's rights. Congressman John Lewis calls him one of the most influential people in my life. Today, he believes that there's still much work to be done. While he's optimistic about America, he believes our society continues to be tarnished and damaged by racism and discrimination. Since 2003, he has taught a class at UCLA that the students call wildly popular. He's part of the California University Northridge Civil Discourse and Social Change Department where he advocates active and civic involvement. And a few weeks ago, UCLA awarded him its highest honor, the UCLA Medal, joining the likes of President Bill Clinton, jazz great Ella Fitzgerald, novelist Toni Morrison, UCLA Chancellor Gene Block said at the time, his message to us is as urgent as it was in the 50s and the 60s. There is a passion that burns inside him that is as strong today as it was at any time in his life, and it continues to drive this giant who walks with us here in Los Angeles. Clearly, an unstoppable voice for social justice and social change in the United States and the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, the eminent Reverend William M. Lawson Jr.
can you? Yes. All right. Yes. All right. Um, um, I'm really kind of excited to be here, except that I do not want to get excited. <laughs> um, I was attacked by a vicious cold Friday night, and I tried to nurse it the last couple of days. Um, but I'm pleased to be here. I did not want to not be here, so I'm glad I'm here. I want to thank all of you for being here at this initial uh, effort by this uh, first congregational church with a long history in Los Angeles. Let's put this kind of evening together on this weekend, and I'm told that they expect it to be a, this is the first such effort on their part, and they expect to do it on this same Sunday for the next hundred years, maybe. <laughs> and, I, and I really welcome that. I, I, I appreciate very much that First Congregational Church has launched this effort, and um, it looks to me from the audience and the choirs that it's an initial uh, exceptional first experience, and I want to see it go on and grow and become a major event in our city, in our region. I'm not gonna try to keep you very long, I want to reinforce the document that I had in my hands in the program. Not simply the music, but I want to document the very excellent message that is there that speaks of Martin Luther King's commitment to social justice and the rest. And I would like to point out to you simply that how exciting it can be for us to have this kind of a holiday, other than the religious holidays and mostly holidays that are rooted in the history of our country. Uh, this is the first and only holiday in the name of a non-political, non-billionaire, non-military man. <laughs> and I happen to think that we, the people of the USA, need to embrace it and make it a weekend and a holiday in which we seek uh, to allow this to be the day when we talk about who we are and what we are and how far we've come magnificent history that is ours, the magnificent biographies of literally millions of people that we don't know that uh, have informed us, and a day and a weekend when we are willing to face honestly and frankly and bluntly the issues that, from our own history, that continue to disturb us and confront us but also then express our great determined nation as a people that these are issues, many of them ancient, ancient issues, these are issues that can be resolved. That, uh, as we have inherited them from literally four or five hundred years of our own history as a people, as a nation, and some of them we've inherited from the last three, four thousand years of the existence of the human race where in many ways the human race has gone wrong. And we need still to correct it. The scholars and paleontologists and others who study these matters say that, for example, the putting women as second-class human beings probably occurred some four to five thousand years ago, was 
Some scholars have called it the first oppression. Uh, well, you and I didn't do that. <laughs> We've inherited it. How it began, I do not know. All I do know is that it's an ancient oppression. And maybe our generation, maybe this century, we have to say that that oppression is one of the oppressions that must end. That we will not tolerate it any longer. That in our own country, in our own city and state, uh, we must ferret out every vestige of that ancient oppression whether ideological or financial structure or political structure or the ways in which we raise boys and girls in our society, whatever is keeping that oppression so vigorous in the United States and elsewhere, we need to use this Martin Luther King Jr. holiday as the day and weekend when we look at ourselves as a people, where we talk about who we are as a people, and where we see the distance from which we have traveled, but also bluntly insists that we still have a huge and extraordinary and beautiful journey to travel. Uh, that every, every human generation, we've inherited these issues no use running around putting guilt on people or blaming it on anyone or trying to shame people in them. <laughs> no doubt most of us gathered in this wonderful sanctuary would not have imposed the oppression against women <laughs> 4,000 years ago. But uh, it's happened, so let's use this holiday in creative ways to call ourselves to truth and to honesty and to the work that we have still to do. And no voice, in my judgment, no voice is more significant or more important than the voice of Martin Luther King, Jr. I do not know how to quite say all of these things in one easy piece. But I want you to know that from my own upbringing in the Christian church, the Methodist tradition, my father being a pastor in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York, where, and uh, my determination that I was going to follow in that path and be a pastor, follow Jesus, and be a pastor for my own life, I knew that by the time I hit the 10th grade in Ohio. Firm in a deep calling, a deep sense of responsibility. Um, 1947, I started college at Baldwin Wallace in Berea, Ohio, just outside the airport in Cleveland. And I was reminded of the name of Mohandas K. Gandhi, and I read his autobiography, and I knew from reading that that's, that that was a excellent portrayal of some of the ways in which Jesus walked in Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth walked and lived and worked, um, and the rest of it, so that uh, I began then to see myself as a, as a follower of Jesus, but as a nonviolent practitioner and disciple. And um, I've journeyed in that direction ever since, um, to the best of my ability. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. and I shook hands for the first time, February the 6th, 1957 when the Montgomery bus boycott began in 1955. I was in India as a United Methodist missionary, coaching, teaching uh, track and field and basketball and tennis. 
um, and all, and um, taking basketball teams for tours around India to play other competing, competing teams. And it was one of the finest days of my life when I read of the Montgomery bus boycott because by 1950, 52, I was convinced that we could put together a movement, nonviolent struggle, that could shake this nation and stop this nation from moving towards perfecting segregation, and racism, and oppression in that form. And uh, so as Martin King and I shook hands, we realized it was destiny. And I dropped out of graduate school at his behest, is saying to me, you have to come south now. I spent by that time some 10 years studying nonviolent struggle in the United States. It's not in the books, but it's in the biographies and it's in a few history places. Great, great. Examples. They didn't call it nonviolence back then, but that's what now the literature compels me to call it. I studied it in Europe, in Africa, in the African National Congress. Uh, Chief Albert Luthuli, who was a Nobel Peace Prize winner from South Africa and his struggles to get a free South Africa, studied it in Europe, in Asia. Um, so I was convinced that it could be then, I, and I knew it was going to happen. So it wasn't then incidental that King and I shook hands and, and I moved on south where I spent some 17 years of my work in ministry, mostly as a pastor in Nashville and Memphis. And uh, I was one of the organizers and strategists for the Memphis sanitation strike uh, where Martin King uh, came to be a part of it. I became one of the volunteer staff people in places like Birmingham and Mississippi and Little Rock, uh, Danville, Virginia, uh, St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, I organized a major effort in Nashville, Tennessee that, that became a model along with the Birmingham, along with the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, so that's a, a, a piece of my work as a pastor, and I want to insist upon that. I'm not a civil rights worker. I think the underbelly or the other side of the gospel of Jesus is the message of love and justice. Justice is the other side of love. Love in its social, personal forms, compassion, a sense of human fairness and decency that embraces all humankind. And um, justice being a part of the goals that we need to exemplify. And too much of Christianity, and I'll say that in this way, too much Christianity in the United States is rooted in dogma and belief systems, and as one who learned to read from the Bible before I started the school, and I still read the Bible from cover to cover, uh, one, many of those dogmas, uh, any number of those dogmas, you will not find them on the lips of Jesus in the four books that we have about Jesus. You will not find them. There. I hope you will disbelieve me to go search yourself and read it carefully and discover that any number of dogmas that we in the Christian church hang on to, you will not find them in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you will not find them in the lips of Jesus in any plain spoken fashion. Uh, so in any case, I, uh, I relish this day it represents a great day for our country. It represents for me, for an example, I, I raised two things for you. First of all, it represents a day in a 
holiday where we should take seriously the preamble to the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal, that all are endowed by the Creator. Now that's, that's our historical document. All are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, any number of our USA historians have said that that became the philosophy of a majority of people in the 13 colonies before July 4th, 1776. Before July 4th, 1776. Some books now written about US history has the 10 year period, 1765, to 1775, and they trace essentially the nonviolent movements that took place in every, uh, each of the 13 colonies. Boycotts, and strikes, refusal to pay taxes, petitioning the king, uh, women organizing sewing groups so that they could sew clothing for people so that they could boycott the British goods. <laughs> A whole range of activities. I never learned that in high school <laughs> or junior high. I learned it since then by my own reading and study. So uh, there it is. We hold these truths to be self evident that all are created equal that all are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. That ought to become the living political philosophy of our nation. I read, I read the papers and magazines and listen to a couple of commentaries on television from time to time, and I hear this word, we need bipartisan politics. I say, no, we don't need bipartisan politics. We need all political parties, all elected and appointed officials, all, us, all of those of us who are not running for office or in appointed positions. We need the politics of, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal. That's what we need. Maybe no nation, maybe no people have ever really tried to organize themselves from that philosophy. But I say to you that Martin Luther King's day is a day for us to lift up that philosophy and understand it, lift up the preamble of the Constitution of the United States and say, we want these forms of politics, the politics of justice, the politics of liberty, the politics of access for every baby born in our society, no matter who they are. We, we, want, we want a politics that insists that indeed the Creator, who made the heavens and earth, as the scriptures declare, expect us human beings to learn to live in such a fashion that we can establish intersections and communities and villages and cities and urban and suburban areas and nations, peoples, uh, where we rid ourselves of our illiteracy, <laughs> where we rid ourselves of pretending that some are strangers and some are alien human beings. We rid ourselves of the notion that there are certain people that you and I should hate or despise because they're not like us, or don't speak our language or worship God in the way in which we worship God, or they don't have our complexion of skin. Much of the ancient literature that has come to us as a human family that we have recovered insists that the way forward is 
for we who are human beings to despise no other human beings for whatever reason. To learn to understand one another. To learn to love each other, to see that we come from the same source. That not only do we have vast similarities in our bodies, in our organs, in our blood, in our DNA, but we do also have that less than 4% of the uniqueness in our fingerprint, our DNA, in our gene map, but largely similar. But that individual difference does not mean, therefore, we should isolate ourselves from one another based upon our differences. But to use our differences for enabling all people to achieve a level of human concord where, in fact, uh, freedom and justice uh, are hallmarks, compassion and love. And this is essentially the definition that I hold for nonviolence. Nonviolence is not simply the absence of violence. The trouble in our society is not the issue of the gun. The gun is more a symptom, a symbol of our ideologies of violence that have made us a very, very violent society in speech with fists and hands as well as with weaponry of all kinds. And we, uh, I grew up in the 40s and 30s and the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. Uh, there were no serial killings, mass killings in our land. What happened to us that we've become this way so that the FBI says that there's a mass killing once a week somewhere? in our country. What's, 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 what's gone on in our society in the last 40 years that we've become this kind of violent society? We were not that way. No matter the issues that were part of us, we were not that way as a people. The issue is not the gun. The issue is the culture of violence that we need to eradicate in our own minds in our own hands, in our own feet. Martin Luther King Jr. is the first Western leader of any stripe who insists that Western civilization cannot survive if it continues its worship of the gun and the bomb and the sword. He said at one point it's a matter of coexistence or co-annihilation. Coexistence or co-annihilation. He introduced nonviolence as a methodology, a philosophy that uses the life stream of love and truth, the creative energy of the universe, a force more powerful than all the other forces that we, we think are better forces, and insists that if we ever learn really to exercise our lives in, out of compassion and truth, we would be astonished at the kind of world, the kind of city we would create. So nonviolent struggle is the way forward, and King is to be honored for that. He is to be honored for the fact that he was a pastor and a theologian. He prepared himself not to be a civil rights leader, to be a pastor, teacher, prophet, healer, thinker. Uh, you know the story of his life. Finishing high school at age 15, finishing college at age 19, doing his master's degree in theology in his very early 20s, and then moving on to the Boston University and picking up a PhD in the, uh, theology, uh, philosophical theology uh, for the purpose of being a pastor, teacher, 
an instrument of change. Um, so he prepared himself for public life, though he did not anticipate the way that life was going to go. Uh, but uh, from the bus boycott of 1955, Martin King recognized that he had been called by God, called by history, and that he would follow suit and do what that demand was upon his life. And he tapped the great life force in himself. Let me give you one illustration and I'm going to con conclude. Uh, a life force that is in each of us. We like to say, well, that was King or that was that person, but we can't do it. No, each of us have been given, been given a life that is a full agency of all the life potential that is available in creation or from God. Each one of us. I'll give you the story quickly. September the 17th, 1958, Martin King is sitting at a counter, a table in a department store in Harlem, New York, signing copies of his first book, Stride Toward Freedom. Still a very good book to read. Suddenly there's a vicious, agonizing pain in the middle of his chest. A woman has stabbed him with a Japanese letter opener. Martin King uh, has been tapping that inside power of life. So he does not cry out, nor does he move. He sits where he is, breathing slowly. He is the calmest person in that phonetic scene. He will not let anyone touch him. He sees them grabbing the woman who plunged this dagger into him, and he says, do not hurt her. She needs help. He waits for the medics and the ambulance, which came. They had several hours of surgery that afternoon and evening. The next morning, as Martin King awakens, the surgeons are in his room, and one of them, the chief surgeon, informs him that they've extracted the dagger, that it was a long, arduous, process and he said to him had you sneezed you would have drowned in your own blood by his very demeanor and power personal power he survived what could have been the end of his life by exercising the heart the soul the mind the strength upon himself. Uh, in many of the demonstrations I've done here in Los Angeles and in the South, we've taught that kind of stuff, that kind of mannerism. You can be the captain of your soul, of your life. It is a massive gift from eternity, birth. No gift comparable to it. It has in it all the stuff of the energy of life itself. This document in the program talks about how the inequality has increased, yes, because some people use that stuff of life <laughs> to identify themselves with wealth and power to the detriment of other people. 
That is so very wrong. That's what slavery was about, from which economically we have not yet recovered because we still have an economy that is rooted in the idea that ordinary families work, which is most of us, 80, 90 percent of us, can live on less than what the work should be rewarding us. These four elements are what holds us back. The spiritual poisons that come from racism, beginning with the treatment of the Indian people of our land, sexism that we brought with us from Europe and other places that we have refined, violence, and then the fourth ism I list as plantation capitalism. The plantation capitalism does not think that every human being is in the sight of God, human and alive and deserving of an infinite gift and journey. Uh, so nonviolence is the way in which we translate love and compassion and truth for the living of our days. There are no human disorders that not, cannot be corrected with the healing, helping powers of truth and love. That's why if you dare to look at some of the pictures of the movement, what I call the nonviolent movement of America, 1955, 1973, 1953 to 1973, 20 years of action, you will see these extraordinary pictures of children and young people and adults facing fire hoses, billy clubs, sitting quietly at lunch counters while people taunt them and seek uh, to uh, hurt them. You see some of those pictures that have great contract, contrast. Well, sisters and brothers, we can learn to be that kind of people. And so the, this final word that I want to lift up is that uh, King, as the person who introduced into the stream of Western civilization the power of love, the power of nonviolent struggle. Um, if you will watch the headlines, violence in Syria and Iraq has only a future of more devastation, of more annihilation, more putting burdens of pain and violence on the children and on the women of those lands. Cannot solve the problems of peace, cannot establish a government that can gain the consensus and trust of the people, cannot remove the old disorders to allow space for new disorder, for new understandings and new experiences of community and justice. Martin Luther King is absolutely right. If you have a chance, go see the statue on Washington Mall. It's an impressive, sacred, experience. This day is about how we become better people. It is about how we do this in pragmatic way, using the economics of truth, the sociology of justice, healing medicine of hope. Our land can be change even more. I remember, for example, growing up in the 40s and 50s, being stopped going into a restaurant by someone who said, you can't eat here. 
by a sign saying no colored allowed. Signs were dotted all across America. Those signs said no WAP, no dirty Irish, no Jew, no Negro, no wetback. They were more prevalent signs in the Southeast and the South Central, but I grew up in the Midwest and they were there. They were in California. If nothing else, our children no longer live in a community where such signs that despise some people are in public places. I was told again and again it couldn't be done. But with the initiative of Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks and others, it became a part of our history And part of the tension that we're feeling today and the division is the tension between the change that has taken place, the opposition to that change, but the change we still need to do. So this evening's concert and gathering is about each of us committing ourselves to the continuing struggle. You don't have to be, try to become uh, any kind of person other than yourself, but in gentle and vigorous ways in your family, in the organizations to which you belong, in your congregations, in your labor unions, in your social clubs, you can push and live the notion leaving the violence behind and letting love enlarge itself in us and each of us. Someone has written, to be what you are and capable of becoming what you are becoming is the single essential purpose of life. King Martin, my friend, brother, colleague, in 11 short years, made a phenomenal movement happen in our land. And you and I are the beneficiaries of it. But you and I can also make our own mark Still too many people homeless, too many children not getting the education they need, too many people with overwhelming health issues that they're not able to resolve, get the attention they need, too many people walking the street, too many jobs that do not pay living wages. Jesus said the laborer deserves his wages. <laughs> So the great struggles yet to continue. And under the inspiration of the music you've heard this evening, under the inspiration of this holiday, Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, under the inspiration of the knowledge that our gift of life is superb, let's you and I continue to struggle so that one day, in fact, we the people of the USA will achieve a far higher level of democracy and hope than we ever have recognized. Thank you.
Who wants to sing one more? Stay standing, choir, come on down. All right, well, let me say, you all sound real good. So, we're gonna need your voices once again. This next one is acapella, and I know you can do it. We're doing all four verses. Then we're gonna sing the first verse again. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna take it up. Okay, you'll find out what that means. They do it very well. Friends, we've had some great nights and some great mornings in this church, but we've not had a better night than this night. Thank you so much. I want to close our concert with a responsive kind of reading. I'm going to offer a line, and then you're going to say, we work and pray. But you got to say it with a little enthusiasm. Let's try it. We work and pray. For the dignity of all God's children. For equality and justice in the world. For respect and compassion. For the well-being of all creation. For peace that brings justice and justice that brings peace. For the vulnerable in our society. For the marginalized in our society. For the immigrants and refugees of the world. For an America that is an America for all Americans. For a global family that recognizes our one humanity. For speaking truth to power and being empowered by the truth. For congressional leaders to stand up for a better humanity. For city leaders to stand up for a better humanity. For a president 
of the United States to stand up for a better humanity. We work and pray. We work and pray. We work and pray. Amen. Exploitation. Oh, what you gonna do? I'm gonna. I'm gonna.